The views expressed on the following program are designed to amplify those of the speaker and not necessarily those of KAAM, DJRD Broadcasting, or its sponsors. It is time to Ask the Pros, the only live, local, interactive radio program that addresses home, health, and wealth matters Monday through Friday. A program hosted by arguably the most knowledgeable and reputable authorities in their respective industries, affording you the rare opportunity to ask them any questions related to their field of expertise for free. Just pick up the phone and call KAAM right now to ask the pro. Now, here's Dr. Bierenbaum. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Dr. Dennis Berenbaum, and this is Cancer Update, a short walk through a long journey. I'm glad you're joining us today. If you want to call in, the number here is 972-445-0770, and the toll-free number is 877-272-5226. Shortly, we're going to have a guest on our program, Dr. Stephen P. Herzog. Dr. Herzog is a, in private practice here in Dallas with the Dallas Neurological Clinic, the Hedick Institute of Texas Neurology. He's the medical director. He practices down at Baylor University Medical Center, and he is a clinical associate professor, Department of Internal Medicine at Texas A&M Health Science Center, College of Medicine. We're going to talk about headaches and in particular headaches related mostly to migraine headaches, and we're probably going to ask them some questions of headaches related to cancer. In the meantime, let me bring you a little bit of an update here. Number one, Tina will not, Tina Withrow will not be with us today. She decided to take a vacation. Uh, why, I don't know. She and uh, Jim are going someplace. I think they needed a passport. I think they're going to Arkansas. So she'll be... Uh, Uh, away from us for about a week, and I hope that uh, they will let her back out of Arkansas. Uh, Maybe she's going, we'll have to get extradition on her. Uh, In the meantime, let me bring you up to date on some uh, articles that have come out recently in the Alternative Medicine Alert. Talks about aspirin and cancer prevention. It has been shown that the use of cancer prevention has been studied for many years. Aspen has been a common preventive agent in cardiovascular disease. They have shown that some of the key findings uh, in that it reduced uh, risk of short-term incidence of and death from cancer and reduced risk of long-term incidence of some kinds of cancers and reduces the risk of distant metastases or spread of cancer. These findings strengthen the case for regular use of aspirin in the prevention of cancer. It appears to confirm at least a modest degree of protection without a large increase in the risk of side effects. As with other forms of preventive strategies, patients should be cautioned that aspirin is only one part of a complete medical and lifestyle program. It should not be used to offset other uh, risk factors. Realistically, it does appear to be a valuable tool in the prevention of health and promotion of, uh, in the prevention, in the promotion of health and prevention of disease. As we had talked about previously a couple weeks ago, nutrition and physical activity guidelines for cancer survivors. The report, uh, this came out of a uh, recent uh, journal, uh, from uh, CA Cancer, uh, July August edition, says the report discusses nutrition and physical activity guidelines for the continuum of cancer care, briefly highlighting important issues during cancer treatment and for patients uh, with advanced cancer, focusing on the need uh, who are disease free or who have stable disease following their recovery. It discussed select nutrition and physical activities and uh, what should be done with these patients, talking about exercising, dietary supplemental use, especially the use of resveratrol, curcumin, and isotonic uh, antibiotics with and without iron, as well as the supplementation of vitamin D and the B vitamins, as well as exercising at least 30 minutes a day for five out of seven days, thereby increasing 
the immune system. It increases the overall well-being of the patient and uh, increases the uh, quality of life of the patient. Another article that recently came out uh, talked about some of the new treatments available and second-line treatments of patients tested with non-small cell lung cancer, uh, showing that uh, doxytoxyl or uh, taxotere, uh, along with uh, uh, some of your EGFR drugs, especially erlotamine or Tarceva, uh, has improved survival in non-small cell lung cancer oh, after at 24 months. Overall survival rates were 32%. Uh, in those patients who were treated with pimentrexate, better known as Olympta, in combination uh, with some of the other agents. Uh, it also brings out in the ASCO post, the August edition, that the landscape for the treatment of metastatic melanoma is tremendously uh, expanding with the approval of two new drugs, Yervoy and Zebeloff. Uh, ushered in a new era for this disease, and now additional treatment options are in late stages. These are drugs that have been approved uh, and are commercially available that your insurance companies will pay for. So in dealing with those patients are, who have family members or they themselves are cancer patients, it's important that you ask your doctors about some of the new treatments. I would also suggest to a lot of patients, uh, I had a very uh, unfortunate occurrence recently of a friend uh, whose family member was diagnosed or said to be diagnosed with a certain type of cancer. Uh, we went ahead and sent the slides down to MD Anderson, to the pathology department, and uh, came out with a different diagnosis. Therefore, the treatment regimen is totally different. Uh, make sure... Uh, that you speak up, make sure that you ask whoever is treating you uh, all the options that are available to you. They may came up, come up with one type of protocol. Find out what other protocols, uh, options that you have. Find out if you can get a second or third opinion. I've always used the adage that you may find that your second or third opinion uh, should have been your first. We're going to take our call. I believe it is Dr. Herzog. Hello. Hello, Dr. Berenbaum. How are you this afternoon? Is this Dr. Herzog? Yes, it is. I gave everybody an introduction on you, your practice here in uh, Dallas at the Headache Institute of Texas Neurology, your association as clinical assistant professor, Department of Internal Medicine at Texas A&M Health Science Center, and your director of medical education up until 2009, Department of Neurology at Baylor University Medical Center. How long have you been in practice here in Dallas? Uh, 24 years. Long time. Are you originally from uh, Dallas? No. Uh, originally born in Chicago and moved to Arizona and then moved to Texas uh, to do my residency at Parkland. Interesting. Let us get on with the topic here. You, Your specialty is in headaches. Is that all types of headaches or primarily in migraine headaches? All types of headaches. Uh, I guess probably the most important finding that we have are patients that come into most – uh, general practitioners or the uh, uh, internal medicine area is that it is one of the primary complaints of most patients that come in. Uh, it's shown here in the literature that I have. It causes almost a 22 to 24 percent interruption in the workforce of people taking off for work because of various types of headaches. Is that mostly migraine headaches that uh, cause this type of uh, work delay or uh, taking off of work, Dr. Herzog? Mostly migraine because of the severity of migraine, but there are some uh, patients with tension headaches or cluster headaches that also miss work. There are a number of other kinds of headaches that are less common, but the majority of uh, uh, work days that are missed would be likely related to migraine. That's correct. Define for the audience here uh, tension headaches, cluster headaches, and then I want to talk to you about migraines. Well, we uh, separate headaches into the primary headache disorders and secondary headache disorders. The secondary headache disorders is when a headache is due to something else, like a tumor or an aneurysm or an infection 
or a metabolic problem. And the primary headache disorders uh, are mainly tension headache, migraine headache, and cluster headache, with the most common headache type being the tension headaches. About 95% of the patient or population uh, has had a tension headache at one time or another. Uh, the least common of the top three headache types would be the cluster headache, with the migraine being in the middle. How is the usual presentation? Uh, are they located one side of the head, unilateral, uh, periorbital? How do they, what's the usual presentation? Well, the presentation of a tension headache uh, would be typically all around the head, or as we would say, holocephalic, in a band-like fashion, generally not a severe headache, often uh, doesn't limit activity, generally is not throbbing, uh, and often is uh, relieved with over-the-counter medication or just rest. They're the milder headache types in general, and often the tension headache patients don't even have to go to the doctor. You know, they take care of the headaches on their own and they know what they have. The migraine headaches are headaches that tend to be one-sided, but they don't have to be. Uh, tend to be associated with light, sound, or smell sensitivity, but they don't have to be. Tend to be associated with nausea and or vomiting, but they don't have to be. And that's where the difficulty in diagnosing comes. So the address of the pain doesn't define it as migraine. As with a tension headache, the pattern of headache pain does define it. So a patient can have headache pain anywhere in their head or neck, and it could be a migraine. Can there be some underlying cause like sinusitis or hypertension that can be a primary underlying cause of uh, uh, different types of headaches? Well, they can be a, a primary cause of a secondary headache. So if you have hypertension, you could have headaches associated with hypertension and high blood pressure, but that wouldn't technically be a migraine or a tension headache or a cluster headache. It would be a headache secondary to hypertension, and that would be true of any other illness that you might have. Now, if you have a secondary illness that can provoke headache and you have a headache disorder like migraine or tension headache, it can make those headaches related to those disorders worse. A progressive headache disorder, a new onset of headache in middle or later uh, life that have not been present when they were younger, adolescent, or college age, are these the type of headaches that need more uh, thorough investigation, maybe uh, uh, studies to be done, MRIs or CAT scans? Absolutely. Anytime there's a, a change in frequency, severity, or characteristic of a headache pattern, it would warrant a discussion with a person's physician. And uh, after 50 years old, if there isn't a history of headaches, that is a red flag, and we always worry about a secondary cause of headache that might be more serious, like inflammation of the arteries, high blood pressure, thyroid disease, uh, something more sinister or serious like a tumor. So we always worry about that in someone over 50 years old. Is the uh, neurological symptoms that usually uh, associate themselves with headaches and principally migraines uh, more related uh, to uh, a pain, or is it to smell or vision? Well, actually, we now think of migraine uh, over the last 10 to 15 years as a genetic disorder. It's a chemical problem of the brain, we, we assume. Uh, and this genetic chemical disorder of the brain makes a person more prone to headache. So that's the cause of migraine. The triggering factors for migraine can be variable, and everyone can be different that comes into the office. One person, their triggering factor might be certain smells. Another person, it might be too much light or bright sunlight. Another person, it might be loud sounds. Another patient, it might be a particular food. Somebody, it might be their stress or their menstrual cycle. So the triggering factors are not the cause of the headache disorder any more than the cat doesn't cause a patient to have asthma a cat only can trigger asthma in a patient who has asthma. So you have to have the genetic disorder we call migraine first and foremost, and then you can be prone to migraine-like headaches. Let me ask you, why is it that foods that contain nitrites or tyramine uh, precipitate headaches in certain people? Probably the, the changes uh, that occur in the blood vessel and the triggering of release of neurochemicals into the brain and around the blood vessel that lead to inflammation that then trigger spasm of the blood vessel and inflammation locally can lead to pain and dysfunction in that area. Is that the same reason for alcohol precipitating uh, cluster headaches? Absolutely, and alcohol can precipitate cluster headaches, which we really haven't talked about yet, 
and it can precipitate migraine, whereas it wouldn't typically precipitate what we call attention headache. Is it the, I mean, I, I, I'm a fast eater, and when I eat ice cream, I eat fast, and you get the famous uh, uh, pain in the eye, periorbital area, and then you get a headache. Is this due to vascular spasms? Uh, it's actually assumed that the ice cream headache is related to alteration in the uh, ganglion or the nerve bundles at the top of the, to the a palate that then alter uh, the functioning of the trigeminal nerve um, and lead to pain. The trigeminal nerve is, is fundamentally what signals and receives information that then is translated to the brain as pain, and the trigeminal nerve supplies everything in the face, the orbit, the sinuses, the jaw, the neck, the back of the head, or the branches of the trigeminal nerve supply those areas. So uh, an ice cream headache is a trigeminally mediated headache. And if we were to rename migraine, uh, you know, because migraine is really the Rodney Dangerfield of, of medicine, it doesn't get a lot of respect, if we were to rename it, we would probably call it trigeminally mediated neurovascular inflammatory pain syndrome. Because that's all that's going on. We don't just see it as a vascular headache anymore. It isn't just inflammation. There's no such thing as just a headache. We don't believe in a regular headache. As a headache specialist, we want to define why the patient is having a headache. So migraine is a real complex disorder that's modulated by the trigeminal nerve. And fundamentally, an ice cream headache is a subtype of headache that is also modulated by the trigeminal nerve. Let me ask you, uh, we always hear the terminology, the aura. The aura of transient neurological symptoms, sometimes headaches may be with an aura, sometimes they may be without an aura. First of all, would you define aura? Well, an aura is uh, a period of time that usually occurs before the headache pain develops in a patient with migraine and sometimes in a patient with cluster. Now, in the old days, we were taught that if you really didn't have an aura, it wasn't a migraine. That's not really true. Actually, only about 20 to 30 percent of patients with migraine will ever have an aura. So the aura is the period of time when there can be some neurological dysfunction, usually preceding the headache, although it can overlap into the headache, and it also can be associated with no headache. In other words, a patient can have an aura because they're having a migraine attack and they may never develop the headache pain. So the aura is a component of a migraine attack, and the aura is usually a 30-minute event in general. Uh, it usually leaves no permanent damage that the patient can sense and no damage seen on any imaging. And it can be almost anything, with the most typical aura being a visual distortion. Uh, let me ask you a question. I know you've seen this and maybe some of your uh, people that work for you. I've seen it in some of the employees I have. I've even seen it in some patients. Uh, they've had an accident many, many years ago and they have developed headaches. And you can do all the studies in the world from cervical spines to x-rays of the head and the skull, and yet you find nothing. Is this a common thing for people that have been in uh, an auto accident or have had a fall on a bicycle or you know they played football one time to have these constant headaches? And what is the underlying cause uh, that you find most of the time? Well, it's not a common thing. As a matter of fact, I, I think if we were to just uh, ask 100 people, probably 98% would say they had hit their head at one time or another, whether they're as a child or a young adult or as an adult. So it's not common to develop long-term headaches after a head injury, although it's not uncommon at the time of the injury to have headaches for a few days or a few weeks. What I find and what we have determined to be the case in most situations is that a person who's had head trauma that has headache that doesn't seem to ever go away. In other words, they transform into a chronic phase of headache. Really, you're defining that as longer than three months after the injury, mm -hmm. is a person who was genetically prone to headache in the first place. Now that's under the assumption everything is normal on the diagnostic testing and the evaluation through the history and then on to the examination. But, but the people that are having these prolonged headaches, we often find that when they say to us in the office, I've never had headaches before, what they really are saying, I've never had headaches like this, either this severe or this persistent. And with the right type of questioning, we can find out for sure whether they did have headaches before. They may have thought they were insignificant, but they're not so insignificant now in retrospect. The patient was prone to headache in the first place, or the family history was positive for headache. They never had headaches before, but given the genetic predisposition, the injury then brings it out. Now, how it does that 
we don't know. And why somebody that has no predisposition but has headache for a few weeks, their headaches get better when they can seem exactly the same, we don't exactly know. But our assumption is that the patient who has prolonged headaches after a head injury, when everything comes back normal, had a genetic predisposition to headaches in the first place. Let me interrupt you a second. What is your uh, office phone number, Dr. Herzog? Our office phone number is uh, 214-827-3610. For everybody listening, I want you to remember that it's 214-827-3610. That's the Headache Institute of Texas Neurology. Dr. Herzog is the medical director. We're going to continue on with some questions here. Uh, how do you differentiate or how do you work up a patient uh, between that of a tension headache versus a cluster headache versus a migraine headache? And how are the treatment modalities uh, different for each one? Well, the... Uh Evaluation in, in the office is generally an evaluation that begins with a history and usually a complete headache history focusing on all the features of their headache, not just that they have headache. We want to know the frequency, the location, the quality, the timing, the onset, the modifying factors, associated symptoms, all of the things that can help us put their headache disorder into a particular category. Now, generally, people in the office, it's not an acute situation. It's, we're not an emergency room, obviously. And we're more often going to find primary headache disorders coming to the office. These are people uh, who have migraine or have tension or have cluster headaches or the less common primary headache disorders. Obviously, if a patient has the worst headache of their life uh, or something is new or different, that patient should go to the emergency department at their local hospital and be evaluated. Um, Should they be evaluated and everything look normal or should they go to their primary doctor and everything be normal, as best they can tell, then they would come to us and we would, after doing a complete history, do an examination to determine if we could find a location uh, of a secondary cause or any indication that there was a secondary cause. Again, still trying to determine is there anything else that could be causing this headache. Because the diagnosis of tension headache, migraine headache, and cluster headache are all what we call diagnoses of exclusion. We have to exclude the secondary causes before we call it a primary headache disorder. People often ask me, well, How do you know I have migraine? Or how do you know I have tension, headache, or cluster? Well, it's because after the history and physical examination and diagnostic testing, if nothing else is showing up, then by exclusion I can put it into that category based on the history. So the cluster headache patients are much less common than the migraine and the tension headache patients, and they're treated differently. Cluster headaches are more common in males to females by about a ratio of 5 to 1. Migraine is more common in females to males by a ratio of approximately 3 to 1, and tension headaches are equally distributed to the population. Tension headache patients usually don't come to the office because they take care of it themselves, lots of things over the counter to use, they've spoken with their primary doctors, and they've given them suggestions, or they've done some reading on their own. So it's rare for me to see a true tension headache patient in the office because they wouldn't get to the level of the headache institute or a neurologist with that type of headache disorder. So the most common diagnosis we see, of course, is going to be migraine. Probably 80% of the patients that come into the office will have a migraine-like syndrome. The evaluation then after the history and physical is done will be determined by what's been done before they come to see us. If there's been a change in frequency, severity, or characteristics, that patient would require some sort of imaging of the brain. Now, that might be a CAT scan or it might be an MRI scan, depending on uh, the type of complaints the patient is making. The uh, MRI scan, of course, is a much more high-definition scan of the brain, uh, and it shows certain things better than the CAT scan does, and the CAT scan is a lower-definition scan using X-ray. But it can also be uh, helpful uh, in looking for things in the sinus or looking for things in the bone itself. So a diagnostic image would be suggested if there hasn't been one done already, uh, depending on uh, if there's been a change. Also, laboratory profile to rule out anything that might be toxic, metabolic, infectious, inflammatory, or an endocrine-related disorder. Rule out anything uh, in the blood that could suggest a malignancy. That would be part of the workup if it hadn't been done previously. And then other studies as we uh, continue the management of the patient uh, might be added depending on whether or not they have spells or are passing out. Uh, An EEG may be indicated. 
or something such as a sleep study if they have poor sleep or if they have a condition uh, that suggests they have uh, obstructive sleep apnea, which can, both of which can worsen headache disorders. Let me the, ask you, uh, okay. I'm sorry, go ahead if you had more to add. Well, I was just going to say then the treatment uh, depends on uh, the frequency of the attacks and migraine. Uh, if the patient has uh, you know, frequent attacks more than three a month, uh, we'd want to begin a preventative program, which may begin with a natural approach, utilizing proper diet, exercise, proper hydration, stress-reducing techniques. Uh, what, what do you advise on diet? Well, we, we start with the triggering factor list, and we, we walk, work with the patient to determine if they've ever identified particular trigger, triggers, and the top triggers being alcohol and nitrates in certain meat and chocolate and certain cheeses and things like that. Although anything can be a trigger in any given patient, we go over their headache calendars if they bring them in. Uh, if they don't bring in a headache calendar, uh, then we encourage them to begin uh, utilizing a headache calendar and writing down as much as they can around the time of a headache attack so that we can kind of look back and then determine if, if certain things are triggers. What uh, medications, I mean, the uh, amount, the plethora of drugs available for headaches, you and I both know is uh, quite large, but in migraines, uh, I mean, how do you ever use Botox in your patients with migraines or in any type of, of headaches? We do use Botox. Botox would be used as a preventative in a patient who has what we call chronic migraine. Chronic migraine would be similar to a patient with chronic bronchial asthma. They have symptoms every day of headache, not necessarily a full-blown attack, but symptoms of headache. Like a chronic bronchial asthmatic would say, I have symptoms of asthma every day, but I'm not necessarily having a full-blown asthma attack. So the definition of chronic migraine is greater than 15 headache days per month with greater than four hours of headache pain on any given headache day if you don't treat it. And if they fit that definition, then Botox would be an appropriate treatment. Now, the FDA approved Botox in 2010 after extensive research over 15 years, uh, and it is uh, available. Now, most insurance providers will not cover Botox for chronic migraine patients unless they meet certain criteria. Now, the majority of patients that come to see me have already tried a number of medications, and the criteria is you have to have failed certain medications first before the, the insurance company will cover uh, the Botox. Very effective. The studies uh, were double-blinded. They confirmed uh, that 70% of the patients responded with little or no side effects in 95% of the patients. Usually becomes effective in about a week, and it can last for two to three months, and so we repeat the treatment every three months. What about Immutrex? Because I hear that's used quite a bit. Is there a point that you can only use so much and then it's uh, the toxicity is too great or that you develop a resistance? Because I hear people on Immutrex all the time, friends of mine, and it just, from their description, it just doesn't seem to be working. Well, like any uh, attack medicine uh, or abortive medicine, uh, the more you use it, uh, the greater the chance that it can lose its effectiveness with time which is why you can't just focus on the attack side. You've got to focus on the preventative side, both from a natural point of view and a medication point of view, if that's appropriate. So if a patient is appropriately utilizing their preventative, then their attack medicines like Imitrex, which is sumatriptan, in the triptan family uh, are generally more effective. And again, using asthma as an analogy, not to, to beat a dead horse, but if a patient overutilized their asthma inhalers, and they weren't on a preventative plan, a controlling drug, or a couple of controlling drugs for their asthma, their inhalers would lose their effectiveness with time. So it really has to be a comprehensive approach to the treatment. You can't just treat the attacks or treat with preventatives. You've got to combine the treatment and, again, adding the natural approach as well. Well, I guess I get to one of my favorite topics as we use it in oncology, acupuncture. Where is its place or is there a place for it in uh, the treatment of headaches? There is. Uh, we have uh, utilized acupuncture in the, in the past, and in people that have a lot of spasm and neck pain uh, associated with acupuncture, or with, associated with their migraines, often uh, will respond well to ancillary uh, non-medical treatments, of which acupuncture is one, physical therapy, uh, exercise, stretching, uh, biofeedback. So as a medical doctor trained in the United States, I can't tell you I know how acupuncture works, all I can say, for some people, it's effective, and it has been looked at as best that kind of a procedure can be looked at 
from a scientific point of view, and there seems to be some validity in headache management. So we often will suggest to our patients if uh, they can afford it, uh, often not covered by insurance providers, but if they can afford it and they want to try it and they're positive about it, then it's more likely to work. If someone's very negative about that kind of a treatment before they even go, it's probably not going to work. So you have to pick your patients carefully for that kind of a treatment. Is there a place for massage therapy in the treatment of headaches? Absolutely. I wish my patients could get a massage every day. <laughs> it would be, it'd be very helpful. But more important than getting a massage would be learning to do stretches and exercising properly. So a massage uh, can be helpful. Um, even during a headache, some people respond, although it can be aggravating to some patients as well. But massage therapy can be a, a good adjuvant therapy, uh, especially in tension headache, uh, but also in migraine headache, it can be very helpful. To the audience, this is a cancer update, short walk through a long journey. If you want to call in, the phone number here is 972-445-0770. The toll-free number is 877-272-5226. We're being joined today by Dr. Stephen Herzog of the Headache Institute of Texas Neurology, Baylor University Medical Center. His phone number is 214-827-3601. Uh, do we have a call there? I'm sorry, what was that, sir? 3610. Okay, 214-827-3610. If you wish to contact Dr. Herzog or the Headache Institute at Texas uh, Neurology. Let's talk about one uh, another topic here. How do you differentiate, because you're not walking around with a CAT scan all the time or an MRI, somebody comes in uh, with a headache that, uh, how does it usually present if they have an intracranial lesion or a metastatic lesion? Well, first of all, is a metastatic uh, cancer lesion uh, to the brain different than a primary brain lesion in its presentation? Uh, in terms of headache, it may not be. Um, a, a person could have a, a primary brain tumor, uh, the implication being the tumor started in the brain itself. It didn't spread from some other organ in the body. Uh, and the symptoms of headache may be very similar. And if the patient, again, is prone to migraine or to tension headache or even to cluster, if there's been a change in frequency, severity, or characteristics in the headache pattern, that might signal that something new has developed because a person could have migraine for 20 years and develop some sort of brain tumor. Their headaches are changing. That would be a signal to us that maybe there's a, uh, a secondary cause. That would lead us to doing a diagnostic image of the brain. So the patient may come in and have a mild headache. It'd just be a little bit different. And we do a scan, and we might find uh, either a benign or a malignant tumor, whether it's metastatic or not. How many times in your experience of 24 years have you had patients uh, not demand but more or less uh, their concern and they want to have studies done in spite, and they've had a long history of uh, headaches, uh, do they insist on having an MRI or a CAT scan above what you would suggest? Well, I don't think it's very often that we uh, see them demanding over what we suggest because often when they come to the office they're coming in worse than they had been so they either have had one before they come to see us or they get one after but patients are often reassured uh, when we tell them that a, that a scan is indicated uh, they're, they're relieved that we're going to look into it especially if they've got anxiety that there is something else going on other than what we think the diagnosis is such as migraine so patients uh, uh, will often be relieved. What can be a little ironic is when we call them and tell them the brain scan looks normal, they can be a little upset because it, to them that doesn't explain why their headaches are so severe. It's and a, when we, then we have to educate them further and remind them that migraine is a chemical disorder of the brain, tension headache is probably a chemical disorder, the same with cluster. These are alterations of neurochemistry. They're not anatomical problems. So we would expect the brain scan to be normal 99% of the time in patients that we think are going to have migraine or tension or cluster headache. But patients, uh, but patients can be very worried about that. They come in and, and, and they'll often say at the you know, end of the evaluation, really the only thing I want to do is get a scan and be sure nothing's going wrong or nothing sinister is going on. 
So that's not uncommon that it's in that fashion. But I wouldn't say that we have people that demand it at our level. Now, at the primary care level, the primary care physicians like the family doctors and the internists and the uh, OBGYN physicians may very well have a more de demanding patient saying, well, I want a brain scan, but often they order them and then send them to us or they send them to us to order it. So I wouldn't say that we see the demanding patient demanding a scan. We're going to take a short break. Please come back with us with Dr. Herzog. Again, this is Cancer Update, a short walk through a long journey. Please come back and join us. Rosalind Slaughter is a very busy wife, mother, and teacher. She didn't have time for cancer. After my first diagnosis, I had two lumpectomies, but the cancer had already spread. The doctor gave me little hope for recovery. That's when I called Texas Hematology Oncology for a second opinion. It had become stage four breast cancer. The physicians and staff at Texas Hematology Oncology Centers aggressively attacked her cancer and were concerned about her quality of life during her treatment. Rosalind has been cancer-free for over eight years now. It really makes a difference who you choose for cancer treatment. Rosalind and others have turned to the cancer treatment offered by Texas Hematology Oncology Centers. Perhaps you should too. Texas Hematology Oncology Centers has offices that are located in Dallas, Carrollton, and McKinney. To call for an appointment, please call 469-453-5500. That's 469-453-5500. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Dr. Dennis Berenbaum. We're at Cancer Update, a short walk through a long journey. The number here is 972-445-0770. I'm fortunate today to have as my guest Dr. Stephen Herzog. He is the at the Headache Institute at Texas Neurology. He's the medical director, formerly a as well as being a clinical assistant professor, Department of Internal Medicine, Texas A&M Health Science Center. His uh, phone number, if you wish to speak with him, and his office is 214-827-3610. Dr. Herzog, first of all, thank you for coming today. I'd like to continue on with our discussion. Can you tell me the difference in the approaches uh, uh, between preventive and attack medicine in the treatment of headaches? Yes, absolutely. The the Preventative treatment, as we talked about earlier, really starts with a natural approach. We talk to patients about their exercise and whether they're doing anything active. We discuss their diet, uh, make sure they're eating properly, and, and try to make sure they're eating rounded meals throughout the day. Uh, we talk about hydration. We talk about the stress-reducing techniques. And then we talk about preventative medications when they're appropriate. Preventative medications, specifically in migraine and in cluster headache, uh, are of various families. There's no one right medication. There's no best medication. There's no, unfortunately, side effect free medication. So when it comes down to a patient needing medication because the frequency of the headaches is such that it's required, we have to negotiate. And we borrow a lot of medications uh, that are used for other things to treat headache. We borrow some of the blood pressure medications. And even though a patient doesn't necessarily have high blood pressure, those medications alter brain chemistry, can improve a patient's headache threshold and decrease their triggerability. We borrow the seizure medicines that are used for epilepsy. They can work in a similar fashion. We utilize antidepressants because they alter brain chemistry in depression and they also can alter brain chemistry in headache disorders to improve a patient's level of functioning. So all of these medications that we, we borrow, we have to put down on the table and discuss with the patient and look for associated problems help us decide which of those medicines might be beneficial. If a patient has migraine and high blood pressure, obviously a preventative choice might be one of the blood pressure medicines. We try to get two for one, bring their blood pressure down, and we'd also help reduce the frequency and severity of migraine. If they have depression or anxiety or a sleep problem, we might choose an antidepressant. If they've got other nerve pain, they've got neuropathy or they've got trigeminal neuralgia 
or they just have pain in their back or neck, then one of the anti-seizure medications, even though they don't have seizures, may be very helpful. Patients often say, I don't want to be on a seizure medicine. I don't want to be on a, I don't have seizures. I don't want an antidepressant. I don't have depression. And we explain to the patients that although they are those kind of medications, they also are anti-migraine drugs and can help in cluster as well. In terms of treating acutely, uh, treating the attack, medications uh, uh, go across the spectrum, all the way from aspirin, uh, if that's indicated, to uh, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents everyone knows about, like Advil and Aleve, the brand names for naproxen and ibuprofen. Uh, to the more migraine-specific drugs, as you, as you mentioned, in migraine patients and cluster patients, we often use the group called the triptans. The triptans were invented in the late 80s, and the gold standard is sumatriptan, or the brand name Imitrex. There are six other varieties of that medication, so there are lots of choices for patients. If they have side effects with one, we may be able to go to another. Uh, we try to stay away from narcotics as best we can in headache patients, because People can become dependent on narcotics, and they can work less effectively with time, and they may not work effectively for some other pain if a patient says has a surgery or hurts their back. So we don't want to overutilize the narcotics in a headache patient. And there is some evidence coming out that actually narcotics in a headache patient change brain chemistry, alter nerve, nerve functioning to actually make the headache disorder worse. So it comes back to the natural approach combined with a preventative approach if possible, and then the appropriate choice for an attack medicine. Sometimes you have occurrences of focal disturbances like aphasia, numbness, paresthesia, dysarthria, weakness. And when I think of all of those presentations, I think of some type of structural or anatomical or something like a, a, a nerve compression. Can these types of presentations, the aphasia, the paresthesia, the dysarthria, occur without any type of structural uh, uh, disturbances in the presentation of headaches? Absolutely. Why? In a patient with, with, well, in a patient with migraine, uh, if they are a patient who has that type of migraine attack, and not all migraine patients do, some patients only have a headache, but if the patient does have aura or if they have uh, a syndrome we call complex migraine, they can have dysfunction of various parts of the nervous system depending on where the blood vessels are irritated and where they're causing spasm and where there's inflammation. So if the inflammation or irritation is in the speech center, it might be what we would call aphasia, uh, difficulty speaking or difficulty understanding for a brief amount of time. If the area is in the sensory center, it might be numbness. If the area is in the motor center, it might be weakness. If the area is in the center that affects memory, it might be cognitive problems. The frontal lobe could be behavioral changes during an attack. So any part of the, the brain can be activated in an abnormal way during a migraine attack, and there isn't always a way to predict in any given patient if they're going to have that kind of spell or not. The difference between uh, those kind of symptoms in a migraine patient and those types of, type of symptoms in a patient, say, with a stroke, is that a stroke is going to follow a particular pattern consistently, and the migraine patient may overlap various arterial supply territories. So this is a patient that might have uh, aphasia uh, with numbness on the side that wouldn't be associated with the aphasia, and that wouldn't fit together like the, the puzzle of the brain works. And that would be a, a, a signal that it's probably not an ischemic problem or a lack of a blood flow problem like in a stroke. Now in a tumor, a tumor can grow in various ways in the brain and it can overlap vascular territories. And so there can be different uh, symptoms that don't seem to fit. And a tumor can also cause pressure on the brain. So the symptoms that are associated with the tumor may not be in the anatomical location of the tumor. It might be distant to that because of the pressure. But the patients with migraine, it's, it's not a dysfunction of blood flow, it's a chemical alteration that spreads across the brain in a particular area that leads to that, those symptoms. We have with us today Dr. Steven Herzog. He is the, at the Headache Institute at Texas Neurology. He is board certified with the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. 
His phone number is 214-827-3610. Let's take the everyday common patient. They've had a diagnosis. You've got them on Immutrex, and they have a severe headache. It's one of their typical migraines. They take their Immutrex. Number one, how, and the headache continues, how long, or should they, but how long should they wait headache doesn't go away should they take another dose of Immutrex or should they take something else and how many treatments should they take before they say oh the hell with this i got to go to the er and when should they go or when should they call their doctor well uh that's uh, again a complex question uh that we generally have an answer that's specific to a particular patient if the patient says you know they've taken a dose of the Immutrex and Immutrex is an appropriate drug for them and it isn't working all the time, we'll tell the patients you can take a second dose within a couple of hours. Of course, if the headache is getting worse in that short period of time between the first dose and the second dose, a patient might have been given instruction of what else to do as a rescue therapy because we try to limit the triptans, of which Imitrex was the gold standard, or Sumatriptan, the brand name is Imitrex, uh, 